What is the value of a reaction in D&D? For a spellcaster with the shield spell, it's really high. For those of us making weapon attacks or using the warcaster feat, it can potentially provide some nice opportunity attacks once in a while, but that's not all that reliable. Well, what if we tried to build a character who could almost guarantee a reaction attack on every single turn? Would it be worth sacrificing damage otherwise to get there? That is the question that I'm trying to answer in my build this week. Welcome to D4. Hey everybody, so here at D4 each week I take a deep dive into character builds for my favorite role-playing games. I like to crunch numbers about them, theorycraft about them, not to try and tell you like the right way or the best way to play a character necessarily, but to explore one potential way to build something with the hopes of creating a character that is both really powerful but also really fun to play. So. If you enjoy creating characters for your role-playing games almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, or if you're just looking for tips or ideas on how to build something that you're thinking about playing, then welcome home. This is where you belong, and I'm so glad you're here. So thanks for watching. My name's Colby. I put out these character build videos uh, every Tuesday, so if you enjoy what you see, I would appreciate it if you'd consider joining the channel as a member. There's a little join button down there, and just for a couple, three bucks a month, you can get like access to the library of write-ups that I create for each of these builds to help you recreate the character yourself a little easier, access to the community Discord server, access to our monthly live Q&A hangout sessions. It's a great way to support me, support the channel, so a huge shout out and thank you to all of my channel members. You guys are fantastic. I couldn't do this without you. I really couldn't. And for everybody else, thank you just for being here. Watching, liking, subscribing. These are also fantastic ways to support the channel, and I appreciate you, whether you're a channel member or not. Right. So, I get a lot of requests from people to do a video on, like, how I come up with character builds or how I optimize characters. And my response to those requests is generally, you don't want to see that. It would be the most boring video of all time. <laughs> Basically, it would just be me sitting in front of my computer for like eight hours with 12 tabs of D&D Beyond open and going, hmm, wait, wait, oh no, that wouldn't work because... Yeah. Oh, but what if we, well, point is, there's not a lot of rhyme or reason to the madness for me. That said, there are a few things that I do think about with pretty much every character build. And maybe the easiest way to describe it would be that I try to like get the most out of every resource that I have available to me as a player. That is, we get an action. So I'm going to make sure, okay, what are we doing with our action? What can we do to get the most out of our action, right? Then I try to figure out how I might potentially weaponize my bonus action, for example. Can I do any Anything potent with my movement other than just position myself. Every character can concentrate on one spell. I think of that as like a resource, right? Should I be concentrating on anything? If so, what? Etc. Etc. One thing that I don't often consider though when going through that sort of checklist is my reaction. We get one reaction every round, right? But it's not always easy to guarantee that we can like reliably weaponize our reaction. So outside of a few builds, uh, like the Eldritch Whisperer, for example, who was using Dissonant Whispers to force an opportunity attack, essentially, or a handful of rogue builds, most recently the Arcane Trickster, so that we could get sneak attack twice per round, right, with a reaction attack, or maybe like the Law and Order Cleric build from a few weeks ago, who was taking advantage of their companions' reactions, anyways, I, I don't really build around it. But what if we did? I mean, there are a lot of feats and features in the game that tell us that if X happens, then we get to make a reaction attack, right? I'm not talking about like rebuke the violent or hellish rebuke or those things that are more kind of like spell effects or just spells. I'm talking full-on weapon attacks here. What if we tried to combine all of the best and most reliable of those features into one build? Could we safely assume that we would get a reaction attack every round or almost every round? If so, that would be incredibly powerful on a martial character who's already making three or four big damaging weapon attacks every round. Taking it from three or four to four or five would be like a 20 to 25 percent damage increase over characters who aren't getting an attack out of their reaction every round, right? Maybe that would be sacrificing, say, spell or smite damage or ability score increases, etc. At the very least, someone should crunch the numbers on that. I offer myself as tribute. <laughs> and so, I proudly present D&D build number 157, the chain reactor, the nuclear reactor. I like that, except 
probably works better on a Nova damage build, and this one is sustained damage, by the way. Uh, how about then just the overreactor. Huge thanks to my good friend Randall Hampton for the art that he put together for this build. He does this every week. He is such a fantastic artist. You guys know that already, I'm sure. If you're interested in following him on social media or potentially commissioning him to create some art for your character or maybe even your entire party, I will, as always, put links in the video description on how to do so. And also, I am really excited to tell you guys about the sponsor for this week, a new sponsor, Immy Ramen. Ooh. Mmm. Mm-hmm. So good. So a lot of you guys already know that I am a huge fan of like finding foods that taste great, but that are like lower carb and higher protein, right? So along those lines, let me tell you about my new favorite ramen company, Imi Ramen. One of the worst things about loving noodles is that most of the time, there's not a ton of nutritional content in them, right? They tend to be pretty high in carbs and fairly low in nutrients otherwise. Well, that is not the case with Imi. They are the tastiest way to cut carbs from your diet, but still get your noodle fix without the uh, food coma that often comes with it. Each packet of Imi Ramen has 21 grams of protein and only six grams of net carbs. Those are some amazing stats for ramen. Some seriously optimized noodles. Best of all, honestly, it tastes delicious. You can pick from six chef-crafted and vegan flavors. Black garlic chicken, spicy beef, spicy red miso. Oh, I hate when you do that. Always oh, scares me. <laughs> or my favorite, a roasted pork tonkatsu, which I'm actually enjoying today. That seriously reminds me of like the tonkatsu that I order at the ramen place just down the street, but a lot more affordable, simpler, and with fewer carbs and more protein. They have like a perfect density to them. They're like just the right amount of chewy. The broth is creamy, savory. It makes a great snack or a light meal. And sometimes I like to add like a hard boiled egg, maybe some beef or pork jerky, some steamed veggies, if I want like a heartier, but still really easy to prepare meal. So. I think you guys should try them out. Go to the website that I've linked in the video description if you would. If you use that link, they'll know I sent you. And then if you decide to make a purchase at checkout, use the code D4 and you'll get 15% off your order. You're welcome. <laughs> and Emmy even has a 30 day money back guarantee so that if you don't like it, just ask for a refund and they'll give you one. You don't even have to return the ramen. Big thanks to Emmy Ramen and let's get back to the build just as soon as I finish my noodles. Mm. All right, at level one, for our starting class, we are going to go bum, 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 fighter. <laughs> but guess what? Unlike other builds, this isn't a one or two level dip and then out. No way. We are actually going almost 100% fighter on this baby, something I very rarely do. I actually had someone in my comments recently, and I apologize for not remembering who it was or writing it down. Uh, they said something like this, hey, none of your tier one builds on your spreadsheets, whether Nova or sustained damage, are mostly fighters. Can you try and make one? And I was like, I mean, every build that I do, I try to make the best that I can. <laughs> sure, sometimes I will artificially restrict myself in the name of character concept, like I'm doing today a little bit with this focus on reactions. But I mean, every fighter that I've ever done, I've tried to get into tier one, right? Every non-fighter that I've ever done for that matter. My goal is really to try and make them the very best that I can think of how to make them, right? It's not my fault that spellcasters are comparatively overpowered in this game. <laughs> and I'm not trying to throw shade at that commenter for the record. It was a valid point and it got me thinking because maybe today could be the day that we create an exception to that no mostly fighters in the tier one rule. We'll see. As for our race, um, what do you think? Are we going to go custom lineage, variant human? You know, I would really love to, honestly. Um, there are 1.21 gigawatts of feats that I would like to take on this character. What the hell is a gigawatt? And I'm gonna talk more about that in the final thoughts, actually, but no. I think that in the name of character concept here, we ought to take a race that can help us on our mission to be the ultimate overreactor. And for my money, the best race to help us in that quest would be a dragonborn. 
actually. That's right, and not just any Dragonborn, but specifically the Ravenite Dragonborn that comes to us from the Wildmount book. I love it when a build uses a race that I've never used before. Hooray! So, now some of you might not be able to use that book at your table, which is a bummer, I understand. But just be sure to remind your DM that even though the book came to us from Critical Role, it is published by Wizards of the Coast, right? It's considered official 5e material, if that helps your argument. If not, we've always got a runner-up here, uh, the half-orc, who, thanks to the orcish fury feat, can sometimes get a reaction attack as well. It's just less frequent than the Ravenite Dragonborn and requires an extra feat to work, so I prefer the Dragonborn if we can get it. As for the rest of us, yes, uh, the Ravenite Dragonborn, those tailless, hardy Dragonborn who actually get dark vision, so that's a bonus. But the main reason we're here, of course, is because they get the Vengeful Assault feature, which says that if you take damage from a creature, doesn't have to be weapon damage, by the way, any damage, which is nice. If that creature is in range of a weapon you are wielding, you can use your reaction to make an attack with that weapon against that creature. Awesome. Reaction attack numero uno. Now, unfortunately, we can only do this once per short rest, but with all of the other ways that we will have to get a reaction attack, I don't mind that so much. It'll be a nice tool to have in our reaction-based tool belt. As for our ability scores, I assume that we're going the point by method as always and say, let's take a 15 strength, a 15 constitution, and a 15 dexterity and take a plus one in each of those, right? Giving us a 16 in all of them. You wouldn't have to take a 16 dexterity here. I feel like it's important for saving throws and initiative rolls, but you might prefer to go 14 dexterity and 12 wisdom, and if so, I wouldn't blame you. As for equipment, um, I, pr I mean, I probably start with a greatsword or a maul here, as they're going to do a little more damage. But before too long, we're going to want either a halberd or a glaive, and then yeah, start off with some chainmail armor. We will be switching to medium armor later. As a fighter one, then we get the second wind feature, which lets us heal ourselves for a D10 plus our fighter level once per short rest as a bonus action, and that's actually being improved uh, for one D and D, which is nice. And then we get a fighting style and. And we are going to want to grab superior technique here. This lets us learn a maneuver from the Battlemaster maneuver list along with a single superiority die, which is annoyingly a d6 for some reason instead of the usual d8. Like other superiority dice we might end up getting later, it resets on a short rest. As for the maneuver that we should learn, it's absolutely repost. Okay, actually you might want brace here, but that's going to eventually be a little redundant for us later. Maybe take brace now and then swap it out later if you want, but anyways, repost tells us that when a creature misses us with a melee attack, we can spend our superiority die and make a reaction melee attack against them. If we hit, we add the superiority priority die in damage. And thus, reaction attack numero dos. Off to a great start. At level two, we get action surge, and though we're not building for burst damage here, I will not say no to some if it just falls in my lap. So yes, now we'll be able to take two actions on our turn once per short rest, and that's, I mean, arguably the single best, like, base class feature in the game that's not spellcasting. I don't really know how you'd quantify that, but it's at least got to be in the running, right? What else? R of protection, extra attack, I guess. But if we're talking things that are unique to one class, Bardic Inspiration? Anyways, that's a whole different video. Action Surge is awesome. At level three, we get our subclass, our martial archetype, and of course we're going Battle Master because we need more superiority dice and more maneuvers. So as a Battle Master, we get Combat Superiority. This tells us that we now have four more superiority dice, resetting on a short rest. These are D8s, as is proper, and we get to learn three more maneuvers. As for what those should be, um, sure, take brace, this tells us that we get to make a reaction attack against an enemy when they move into our reach. So with an opportunity attack, right, we get to make an attack against them with our reaction when they move out of our reach. And now it's like coming and going. Problem is, we will shortly have something that will let us do that when they move into our reach by default without spending a superiority die. And it's arguably better. It doesn't do extra damage, but we'll get into it. Anyways, Maybe take Brace for now and then swap it out later. And actually, yeah, do that because thanks to Martial Versatility, the optional class feature that came to us from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, we could swap out the Brace Maneuver like at the very next level when we get a feat, so go ahead and take it for now. Other than that, I'm probably taking, yeah, my favorite, Trip Attack, which lets you attempt to knock an enemy prone when you hit them, adding the superiority die in damage, then forcing them to make a strength save or be prone, meaning we 
and others uh, making attacks within five feet of them get advantage on our attacks. Very nice. And I think I'm probably taking precision attack here as well. It lets us add our superiority die to the attack roll, and we can even wait until after the roll to decide. Super nice when we really need to hit, and I guess we feel pretty confident as to what the enemy armor class is, right? So we are pretty sure that that uh, superiority die is going to help us get there. At level 4, we get our first ability score increase or feat, and yeah, of course, we are going to go with Polearm Master. Not only because it lets us use our bonus action to make an opportunity attack with the blunt end of the weapon, right? If we're using a halberd or a glaive here, which if you're not yet, if you're not up until this point, make sure you switch to, but also and most importantly for this build because it lets us make yes, an opportunity attack when a creature moves into our reach. And the wording here is important, actually. So far, the things that we've gotten to make a reaction attack were not called opportunity attacks, just an attack with our reaction. So remember that for later. But anyways, yes, now we get an opportunity attack, whether they're moving into our reach or leaving our reach, and thus the redundancy with the brace maneuver, so feel free to swap that out for something else. Now, there's definitely an argument to be made here that you should go Great Weapon Master instead at this level. If I weren't prioritizing getting reaction attacks above all else, I just might do so. I mean, I would hate giving up a free bonus action attack every turn that Polar Master gives us, but the plus 10 to damage at a minus 5 to hit that we get from Great Weapon Master just might outweigh that bonus action attack depending on the enemy armor class, right? Especially at like low enemy armor classes. And I mean, if we can knock them prone with a trip attack, then if you add advantage, Great Weapon Master is going to out damage even moderate enemy ACs when compared to Polearm Master. And Great Weapon Master does give us a bonus action attack if we crit or kill an enemy on our, on our turn, which can happen with some regularity. And we could keep that brace maneuver, letting us keep the if they move into our range we get a reaction attack thing. But <sighs> no, I want to consider this damage sustainable, and I want to use trip attack when I can, but more important is saving those superiority dice for riposte attacks when I need them. So swapping to a polearm now and getting a resource-free opportunity attack on an enemy when they move into reach is the way to go, at least for this build, I think. Anyways, at level five, we get, yes, extra attack. So now with polearm master, we're getting two attacks with our action, one with our bonus action, and then yeah, a fourth with our reaction, a lot, maybe most of the time, on our turn, and that is fantastic. But at level six, things get even better because yeah, one of the main reasons that we're going mostly fighter on this build is for all of those juicy and delicious extra feats that they get. We need them all. So at this level, I'm actually still not going to take Great Weapon Master. Remember, we're prioritizing reaction attacks, and so I think we need just one more to secure our place in the greatest overreactor of all time. Yes, I'm talking about Sentinel here. This really is such an amazing feat. You should consider getting it on every melee martial character that you ever play, honestly. I don't give it enough love in my builds. It gives us some wonderful benefits. First off, it tells us that when we hit a creature with an opportunity attack, specifically, not just an attack with our reaction, right? And that's why that distinction was important. But when we hit them with an opportunity attack, their move speed becomes zero for the rest of the turn. So yeah, of all of our reaction attacks available to us, aside from just a normal opportunity attack that everybody gets, the one from Polearm Master is the only one considered an opportunity attack. But now, if we make one against an enemy who is moving into our reach, I mean, since we've got a 10-foot reach glaive or halberd, if that opportunity attack hits as they're as they're moving towards us, they are stopped dead in their tracks. And if they're a melee enemy with only a five foot reach, and that's like the majority of melee enemies in D&D 5e, then they're just stuck sitting there looking stupid, likely unable to hit their intended target. This is a pretty well-known shtick in 5e. Uh, Chris, Triant Monk, and I talked about it way back in our uh, Rune Knight uh, video years ago. But yeah, such a fun combo there. That's probably really going to frustrate your DM. Apologies to DMs who have to deal with this. But this is not even the best part, for us anyways. The best part is that with Sentinel, we get to make a reaction attack against a creature simply for attacking someone other than us. It doesn't matter where that other creature is, by the way, that they're attacking, and that is so awesome. We just have to be within five feet of the enemy when they make the attack, right? Also, we get to make opportunity attacks against creatures, even if they take the disengage action. So good, so good. Okay, 
At level 6, it is time for our first damage report. Let us take stock of where we're at with this character right now. Here are all the ways that we have currently to use our reaction to make an attack against an enemy. One, if they try to move out of our reach, just like everybody. Two, if they try to move into our reach. Three, if they do damage to us, any damage. Granted, this is only once per short rest, but still. Four, if they miss an attack against us, thanks to the riposte maneuver. And finally, five, if they make an attack against anyone other than us, and we're standing next to them when they do so. So basically, if they try to approach or run away from us, and if they try to attack us, whether they succeed or fail, or someone else, whether they succeed or fail. It feels to me like we've got our bases pretty well covered here. So the question is, how often should I assume that we're realistically getting an attack with our reaction? And surely it's not every single time, but I mean, it's gotta be the vast majority of the time, doesn't it? If I assume that we're getting a reaction attack 90% of the time, is that too much? It feels about right to me. The only times we won't get a reaction attack is if the enemy successfully harms us, but we've already used our Ravenite reaction since our last short rest. If no enemy within five feet of us ever attacks anyone else in our party, or tries to attack us but misses, and like no one ever moves towards or away from us. So sure, there will be rounds when like none of the triggers happen for us, but it feels to me like that's gonna be the exception to the rule. Anyways, I'm gonna assume a 90% chance at a reaction attack, and you can adjust the numbers slightly lower if you want. Other than that, should I assume that we've got advantage on our attacks? I'd love to, but probably not. We kind of talked about this already. Trip attack is great, but I feel like I probably need to be saving those superiority dice for riposte. Granted, there will be plenty of times that I'll be getting a reaction attack without needing to use riposte, but with five superiority dice currently, it's tough to assume that I'll be able to knock an enemy prone every round and still have a superiority die whenever I need it for riposte. Plus, it only works on large enemies or smaller, and they get a strength save, so I'm not gonna assume that we are spending a superiority die for trip attack every round. Thus, I'm just going to assume on our turn that we are getting three attacks, two with the d10 sharp end of our polearm, one with the d4 butt, and that 90% of the time we're getting a d10 sharp end reaction attack. Each one of those is going to add three for our strength modifier, and once per turn, I'll assume that we're getting an extra d8 from a maneuver. Sometimes that'll be for riposte, sometimes we'll get a reaction attack otherwise, and maybe we can use trip attack then, right? We've got five of them, they reset set on a short rest, and most combat encounters in 5e at most tables are over by round 5, so I don't think it's too big a stretch to make that assumption. As always, I'm trying to explore the limits of what's possible, right? If all of our attacks landed, then we would be looking at 3d10 plus 1d4 plus 12 damage in a round. And so, against enemies with a 10 armor class, we would on average do 39 damage per round, and against an enemy with a 15 AC, it would be 29 DPR. And that's good. Not top of the class or anything, but compared to other sustained damage builds that I've done to date, at this level that puts us kind of middle of tier 2. Definitely above average. And hey, you've got some decent control capabilities with Sentinel and Polearm Master, some decent burst damage capabilities with Action Surge, and we're decently tanky as well. We're in a really solid place here, and it's only going to get better. Now, at level 7, we are at a bit of an impasse. I really want Great Weapon Master. Again, if it were me playing this character in game, I might have taken it instead of Polar Master or Sentinel, or more likely I would have gone like Variant Human or Custom Lineage instead of Ravenite Dragonborn so that I could have gotten everything I needed by six. There is a problem though. As nice as the plus 10 damage we get from Great Weapon Master is, thanks to the minus five to hit penalty we incur when using it, right now, if we had it turned on, we would do less damage on average against enemies with as little as a 14 AC and higher. How many enemies are you fighting at level seven with a 13 AC? or worse, right? My guess is not that many. Now, if someone in your party is reliably casting Bless, and you have like a plus one, plus two magic weapon, or maybe someone's throwing out fairy fire, etc., then sure, maybe stay fighter here and grab Great Weapon Master at eight, right? But since I'm building this character in a vacuum, not knowing what magic items you might have, nor what your companions are doing, the number one thing that we need right now before even getting Great Weapon Master, in my opinion, is a reliable way to get advantage on our attacks. And for a strength-based melee character, the easiest way to make that happen, of course, is by taking some Barbarian levels. So I think that's what I would do here. This means at Barbarian 1, we'd get 
rage. And this lets us, twice per day for now, as a bonus action, go into a Raging Fury, granting us an extra 2 damage per strength-based melee weapon attack, resistance to all bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, really nice, and even advantage on strength checks and saves. All great things. Don't forget, you can't concentrate on or cast spells while raging, and it ends early if you don't make an attack or take any damage in a round. We also get Unarmored Defense at Barbarian 1, and this gives us an armor class equal to 10 plus both our dexterity and constitution modifiers if we're not wearing armor, but that's a trap for us. We're going to stick with armor, though note that we are going to want to be using medium armor from here on out, as our most important features, rage and reckless attack, don't work if we're wearing heavy armor, right? But yes, speaking of, at level 8, we would be a barbarian 2, and that means we get the almighty reckless attack, letting us on our turn decide to attack recklessly, giving us advantage on our attacks at the cost of giving enemies advantage on their attacks against us until our next turn. Totally worth it, in my opinion. One note, currently Reckless Attack only gives us advantage on attacks that we make on our turn, meaning if we're attacking on someone else's turn with our reaction, no advantage, which is lame. Wizards of the Coast realizes this lameness and is changing it for one D&D so that it just lasts until your next turn. Good job, Wizards. Here's hoping that your Dungeon Master takes the hint and allows for the same at your table, but make sure to talk with them beforehand to clarify. We also, at Barbarian 2, get Danger Sense. This gives us advantage on dexterity saving throws, so long as we can see the thing that we're saving against. Not bad. But at level 9, with that most important feature, Reckless Attack, secured, I think we go back to Fighter, both for feats and for other Fighter features to come. So yes, this means we would be a Fighter 7, and as a Battlemaster, we get Know Your Enemy. This is actually a pretty fun bit of utility that you don't often get with Fighters. You Spend a minute observing or interacting with a creature outside of combat, and then can learn if they are equal, superior to, or inferior to you in two, like, character features of your choice. The requirement to spend a minute doing this makes it tough to find a combat use for it, I think, unless you can, like, get a villain monologuing, or you've managed to, like, stealth up on an enemy and can study them before they know you're there. But even then, it'll still come in handy fairly frequently over the course of a campaign, I think, right? Outside of combat no question. We also get, uh, well, what would be a sixth superiority die here per short rest, and two new maneuvers. And as far as which maneuvers to take, I'm just going to say pick your favorites. I love menacing attack to make enemies afraid. Goading attack is great to really lean into like your capabilities as a tank, right? Giving enemies a bit of a soft taunt, imposing disadvantage if they attack anyone but you. But you might prefer other things to provide buffs or utility or that make your allies stronger. Pushing attack also is great if you're fighting on a bridge especially, or if you have an ally using, you know, a moonbeam or something. Lots of really great options here. Have fun. Okay, at level 9, it is time for our next damage report. Since last check, the biggest gains that we've made have come from that extra two rage damage per attack we get, as well as, more importantly, the advantage we now have on most of our attacks, at least, from Reckless Attack. In addition, we've picked up some decent survivability thanks to damage resistance and dexterity saving throw advantage, and even some additional utility via more Battlemaster features and maneuvers and superiority dice. But at this point, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would on average do 53 damage per round, and against a 15 AC, it would be 47 DPR. And that's much better, actually, especially against those middle and high enemy armor classes. We're still, though, kind of middle to bottom half of tier 2 compared to other sustained DPR builds at this level. But that is both solid damage coupled with a nice bit of tankiness and even utility as well. And, of course, it's about to take a huge step forward. Because, yes, now that we finally have a decent hit chance, thanks to easy advantage, it's time to grab Great Weapon Master. So, level 10, we'd be a fighter 8, we get another feat, and that's absolutely the feat that I'd want to take here. As we've already discussed, yes, this lets us make a bonus action attack when we get a crit or kill an enemy, and I mean, for us, the only difference there is we'd be using the sharp end even for our bonus action as opposed to the butt, right? But more importantly, lets us add 10 flat damage to our hits with heavy weapons if we're willing to take that minus 5 to hit penalty for doing so. At this point, it makes a lot more sense to use the feat, and we wouldn't need to turn it off until about enemy AC of 8 
18 or higher. And of course that goes up if we're using a weapon that gives us a bonus to our hit chance or if someone's casting bless on us, etc. And don't forget, we've got precision attack as well, right? We don't necessarily want to burn through all of our superiority dice spamming precision attack, but if it can turn a hit into a miss, that's better damage on a single attack at least than saving the superiority die to add a d8 to a different attack that already hit, right? Right. At level 11, we would be a fighter 9, and that means we get Indomitable, probably my least favorite fighter feature in the current version of 5e. They are fortunately greatly improving this for 1 D&D, but for now it just lets us once per day re-roll a failed saving throw. Once in a while, it'll be a big lifesaver. Most of the time, you're probably going to just fail your saving throw anyway. That's my experience, I suppose. But regardless, don't go blowing this on a fireball or anything. Take that damage, save it for like mind Control. At level 12, we would be a fighter 10, and that means as a battle master, we get improved combat superiority, which turns all of our superiority dice into D10s. Not huge, but it's a nice little bump. And then we do get two new maneuvers here as well. So feel free at this point to splurge and grab that tactical assessment maneuver that you've been eyeing, but having a hard time justifying. So yeah. PYF. Pick your favorites. At level 13, we would be a fighter 11, and this, of course, is the promised land for fighters because unique to this class, we get extra extra attack, making three attacks now with our action every single time we take the attack action, and that's incredible, meaning that we will potentially have five great weapon master infused attacks every single round if we can get our reaction attack in, and we are doing so fairly reliably, and that's pretty amazing. So let's see what the numbers look like with our level 13 damage report. Since last check, we have finally added Great Weapon Master, bumped our superiority die to a d10, and picked up that sweet, sweet third attack every action. We've also grabbed a bit of defensive and utility capacity along the way. And so, against enemies with a 10 armor class here, we would on average do 107 damage per round. And against a 17 AC, it would be 72 DPR. There we go. That feels much better, launching us well into the middle of tier 1, compared to other builds that I've done to date at this level, and enjoying a lot of nice benefits outside of damage thanks to our durability and Battlemaster utility. At level 14, we are going to be a fighter 12, and that means another ability score increase or feat, and that means we can finally bump our strength score. <laughs> Wait a second, have we gone this whole time sitting at a 16 strength? I know, it's hard to believe, but yeah, prioritizing reaction attacks above all, like we have, it's left us languishing a bit uh, with a good not great strength score all game. Here's hoping that you've managed to get yourself a nice belt of giant strength or at least gauntlets of ogre power or something, but now we're finally bumping it to an 18. Whew. At level 15, we would be a fighter 13, and that means we get indomitable twice per long rest. Oh good, because if there's a way to take a bad feature and make it really good, it's just by giving us more of that bad feature, right? Seriously though, in 1 D&D, it's going to let us add our fighter level to that reroll on a failed save, which takes something from, I guess I'll roll, but I'm probably going to fail again anyways, to an almost guaranteed success. And that's super nice. Can't wait for that change. DMs, implement now, please. At level 16, we would be a fighter 14, and hooray for fighters, and their many, many feats and ability score increases, because yeah, we get another one here. I mean, imagine if we were trying to do this build with any other class. We'd be screwed. But now, finally, we get to cap that strength score at 20, improving not only our damage, but don't forget, if we have a maneuver that allows for an enemy saving throw, right, it uses our strength or dexterity modifier for the DC. So this really helps us in a ton of ways. And then finally, for us, at level 17, I mean, we could stay fighter here and grab the Battlemaster's Relentless feature. It tells us that when we roll initiative and have no superiority dice remaining, we can regain one. Oof. I mean, maybe if it were like half of our superiority dice or something? I just, yeah, that's that's not amazing. If we were going to keep playing to level 20, I might stay fighter anyways just to get two action surges and our superiority dice up to d12s, I suppose. Or maybe, better yet, take some ranger levels. We could go hunter and then take the giant killer option. That gives us a reaction attack when a large or larger creature within five feet of us tries to hit us, whether they hit or miss. I was tempted to build this in earlier, but the large or larger thing kind of kept me away from it. 
It's a little too situational for my taste. And maybe while I'm at it, let me give some honorable mentions to some other things in the game that can give us reaction attacks. I mean, there is the Dissonant Whispers trick. If we wanted to be a caster and you cast it and they fail their save, they have to move away from you. And yes, that would provoke an opportunity attack. Jeremy Crawford even says so. Look it up if you have to. The Mage Slayer feat potentially lets us make a reaction attack against someone if they're casting a spell. Uh, the Monks Deflect Missiles technically kind of could count as long as you uh, reduced the damage enough, right, against a ranged attack. And that actually wouldn't be bad. We don't have a lot of great ways to deal with ranged attackers here. The Way of a Cobalt Soul uh, gives an additional reaction. It's two reactions, potentially, though that is unofficial material, technically, so I probably wouldn't want to use it. Monster Slayer Ranger gets a reaction attack, but it's not until level 15. Drunken Master can redirect an attack with a reaction. Berserker Barbarians get a feature, but not until level 14, right? Uh, tunnel Fighters uh, are really great for this concept, but they're also Unearthed Arcana, not official content. Level 18 Cavaliers uh, might be the best of all, potentially getting an opportunity attack on every creature's turn, but not until level 18. And then there are other things that are a little more spell, like Warlock Rebuke of the Talisman as a reaction attack, but not a weapon attack. Attack, hellish rebuke like I've mentioned uh, gift of the gem dragon feet the same thing it just does damage it's not a it's not a weapon attack so I really kind of tried to just focus on the things that either worked a little more reliably and or that we could pick up at a relatively early level right thus for us here at level 17 I say we just go ahead and end the build back in barbarian doing so is gonna give us a much desired third rage for long rest we've been trying to get by on two thus far meaning a lot of us probably aren't getting to rage every single fight. But also, Barbarian 3 would let us pick up a subclass. Feel free to go Bear Totem for damage resistance, or Giant if you want to grow big, or maybe Ancestral Guardian to improve your tanking capabilities, but my favorite here is Zealot. So that's the way that I'd go, I think. That's going to give us Divine Fury so that we can, on our first attack per turn, do an extra D6 plus half of our Barbarian level in damage. Not a massive bump, but building for damage like we are, I'll take it. And then also there's Warrior of the Gods, uh, which simply lets people who try to resurrect us from like actual death do so without spending the very expensive spell components. And that's just thematically really cool, I think, and also potentially useful on those rare occasions when you totally kick the bucket and your cheap A cleric doesn't have any diamonds on him, I suppose. But anyways, at level 17, it is time for our final damage report. Since last check, we have capped our strength score and picked up that little bit of extra damage from Divine Fury. Other than that, we've just gained some nice quality of life and defensive benefits mostly. But against an enemy with a 10 armor class here, we would now do 130 damage per round on average. And against an 18 AC, it still almost breaks that century mark at 97 DPR. And that is awesome. At keeping us kind of still in that middle, maybe bottom half of tier one compared to other DPR builds at this level without a single spell and with a lot of tankiness and a little utility to boot. So let's bring it all home here in some final thoughts. The tier score for this character. If you were to take the damage that they do at all of the armor classes that we calculate for at each of the four damage reports, just average it all into one big number, we end up with a 57 and this puts us very near the top of tier two. Sorry commenter, I tried. I really did. But okay, here's the thing. I mean, the most common complaint that I get on my videos, second only to, dude, your videos are so long. <laughs> the build doesn't even start until seven minutes in. You talk too much. Is variant human or custom lineage again? Ugh. Pick something less boring. You use it as a crutch. And believe me, I get it. But had we gone with variant human here, would we have made tier one? With a free feat at level one, letting us take Polar Master there, we could have gotten Sentinel at level four, still 
kind of prioritizing that reaction attack theme, and then Great Weapon Master at level 6 in time for our first damage report. Now, giving up that Ravenite racial feature would probably cost us a reaction attack per short rest. I mean, maybe not. It's possible that between Polar Master, Sentinel, and Riposte, we'd have what we need to still get a reaction pretty much every turn, but I have a feeling that we would feel that loss of being able to make a reaction attack just when we take damage that we got from Ravenite Dragonborns, right? I'd probably have to adjust my assumptions on how often we were getting a reaction attack from like 90% down to 75% of the time or something. And that would negatively impact the numbers. Just for fun though, I redid them, going Variant Human, but then assuming a 75% chance at a reaction attack, and the numbers were better at level 6, they were way better actually at level 9, and they were still a little better at 13, but then worse at 17 by the time we actually finally got our strength score capped and had all of our feats and stuff right. In the end, that build had a tier score of a 60.3, which... Yeah, I mean, you've got to take all of these numbers with a grain of salt, right? We're making a lot of assumptions, but 60.3 still keeps us in tier two, if just barely so. Anyways, that is why I go Variant Human or Custom Lineage all of the time. A free feat is just so potentially powerful in this game. You know this already, I know, but it's actually one of the changes that I'm most excited about for one d and The way that everybody is gonna get a free feat at level one, but that most of like the most powerful feats aren't available until level four. So even humans who can get two feats instead of everyone else's one at first level aren't necessarily going to be the no-brainer choice for race or species, I guess. Mechanically, anyways, opening things up a a little bit more for choosing other species to build on. And yeah, it's why most of the time when I'm making a racial choice other than variant human or custom lineage, I'm usually doing so in the name of like a stated character concept goal that goes beyond simply do as much damage as possible. And it's why I'm sticking to my guns here on the Ravenite Dragonborn. And it makes me happy to know that generally speaking, maybe outside of a few levels, levels eight and nine especially, the numbers aren't massively different either way. So I have no regrets. But regardless, here's the good news. Even sticking to that artificial restraint, this build is still the best sustained damage dealer that I have done to date that's mostly a fighter. Beating out the previous frontrunner, the uh, Eldritch Blade Master, by a few points. I think I have one card left, I hope. So hey, we're getting closer to tier one. And when you combine that great damage that they do with the tankiness and utility and even potential control and support that this build could bring, I think it would be an absolute blast to play in game, despite being mostly just a boring old vanilla fighter. So I certainly hope that you get to try it yourself someday, or that I get to uh, too for that matter. But regardless, that's the build for the week. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you know how much I love you, because I do. Thank you so much for all that you do for me, for the channel. You are awesome. And I hope that you have a great day and a fantastic week. And if you don't, I believe that you can hang in there. So please do. I hope that you will do good and be kind and stay safe and that I see you again very, very soon. But until then, take care. Bye. That felt short. Was that short? I think that was a little short. Sorry for everybody out there who says that I shouldn't worry about length and that I should go over an hour anytime I want to. Um, maybe Dallin will just make the outtakes extra special long. Should I do something funny? <laughs> you can't, you can't just do something funny on demand. It's gotta be spontaneous. <laughs> okay. All right, let's see. You can't say you made the choice in the matter of your birth. Who brought about that fateful day? You are here and born with fire and desire. You're the only one to stand in your own way. And there's no making cases, forgetting out, trading places. And there's no turning back, no, you are here, <laughs> no, you are here. Oh, had to sing a Waylon Jenny song today because I got the, I got the shirt. Oh, the best folk trio of all time. I'm not going to be able to change my mind on that one, so good luck. They are such beautiful singers and songwriters. 
Check him out if you haven't heard of him. Oh, Gandalf. Gandalf, you're falling into the pit for your time. Oi. Yeah, that's still off, isn't it? Staying fisheye camera makes everything look a little warped. That's all right. No, that's still bugging me. <laughs> it's like, maybe it's down or fixed. Whatever. <clears throat> Repost, repost. I think most people say it repost. With four superiority dice currently, five. No, five. Yeah, I have five. Uh, uh, and take the giant slayer killer. The giant killer. It's giant killer, not giant slayer. And take the giant killer option, or is it giant slayer? Gosh dang it! Now I gotta look it up. This is slow. Need some elevator music or something. <laughs> Feels like I'm playing Mass Effect 1. Just those interminable elevator rides while my while my teleprompter scrolls all the way back to my preamble. Come on. Ooh, still not at level one. <laughs> level one, there we go. Woo! Okay, that's all of them that I could think of. So now I gotta scroll back down. Hey Garrus, how's it going? It's Tally. What's up? Actually, no, I probably wouldn't have Tally. I'd have uh, Liara. I know, Tally is awesome. She's awesome. But I was always kind of a Liara guy. And I mean, you can't not have Garrus, because he's the best companion in any video game ever made. Like, no question. Yeah. Second maybe to Karlak? I now want a crossover game where I can play with Karlak and Garrus as my companions. I don't care what the game is. Set in the Mass Effect universe? Great. Set in the Baldur's Gate universe? Awesome. Set in a totally different universe? I'm okay with that too. Just gimme Garlak. <laughs> <laughs> level 11, level 12, level 13. Move a little quicker at the end. Okay, almost there. 14, 15, 16. <sighs> Back to where I left off. <laughs> Need to do some warm up exercises today. La 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 la. Watermelon, watermelon. Blah, 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 blah. 